Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Colby, and I'm with Practical Farmers of Iowa. Accompanying me behind the scenes and providing technical support is Phoebe Eichhorst. We will shortly be joined by Sam Hitchcock Tilton, cultivator enthusiast and organizer of the Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day. And today, Sam is at Springdale Farm, run by Peter and Bernadette Seeley near Plymouth, Wisconsin. We won't see Peter until next week, but Sam has a plan of his own and a machine shed at his disposal to discuss the big picture and finer details of cultivator setup. But first, like an old movie, we start with the credits at the top. I'd like to thank our organizing partners for their work on this field day. The Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day is an annual event held on farms across the exotic galaxies of Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and in 2021, the deep space of Iowa. The event brings together vegetable farmers, field crop farmers, and industry reps to demo and discuss the latest in field cultivation equipment. We're glad to be joining virtually this year, but look forward to seeing you all in person in September 2021. Also, the Land Connection is a nonprofit based out of Champaign, Illinois. The Land Connection trains farmers in resilient, restorative farming techniques, informs the public about the sources of our food and why that matters, and works to protect and enhance farmland so that we, and generations to come, will have clean air and water, fertile soil, and healthy, delicious food. Learn more at thelandconnection.org. And Practical Farmers of Iowa is a farmer-led nonprofit based out of Ames. We specialize in farmer-to-farmer -farmer knowledge sharing and farmer-led research with a mission to equip farmers to build resilient farms and communities. All are welcome at PFI. We invite you to learn more about our organization and access our vast collection of resources at practicalfarmersoforg.org. This virtual field day will run until 1.10 p.m. Central Time. If you have questions for Sam, uh, during this field day, please type them into the comment box on Facebook, and I'll do my best to relay those uh, through the void of space and the internet uh, during the field day. And at the conclusion of this event, please give us your feedback via the online survey, and we'll uh, post a link in the comment box for that at the end. Virtual events are new to us and always room for improvement, so we, we love to get that feedback. And so, Phoebe, let's check in and see if Sam's Wi-Fi is working over there. Hey, Sam, you're sideways, but we see you. You may have to unmute yourself as well. We seem to be having all of the little technical difficulties. One more shot to unmute yourself, I think. Yep, try the unmute again, Sam. There How is go. that? Can you hear me? You are yeah. unmuted, but you're sideways. <laughs> ah. Oh, I know this one. Let's see. I have to unlock. Yeah. Un yep. You put your screen on lock. Uh, let's see. Uh -huh. Any direction there, Liz, on unlocking it? So you'll need to pull up from the bottom of your screen, probably. And there should be a rotate with a lock around it icon. That'll work too. Oh. Yeah, you're, okay. you're up oh, right cool. now if you just want to go ahead with that for now. Okay, cool. Um, okay, welcome to the uh, fourth annual Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day, everyone. Uh, I'm sure this year has uh, been very interesting for all of you as it has for me, um, but nonetheless, we persevere. So uh, uh, the field day is very different this year, just like things are on your farm. Um, we usually uh, welcome uh, hundreds of people from around the Midwest and sometimes from around the country to a different host farm. Uh, and there we have farmers of all types. We have uh, machinery companies of all types, uh, allied trades in the vegetable uh, farming industry, uh, and researchers too from all over the world, which is always really neat to get everyone together. And this year, we do it virtually. So welcome uh, to the beautiful uh, Kettle Moraine Hills of Springdale Farm. Uh, on the western side of Lake Michigan. So we're just uh, straddling Lake Michigan from where we were last week. Um, Peter Seeley and his family here grow uh, about 30 acres of vegetables for uh, 800 member, 1,000 member CSA. Um, and Peter will be joining us next week, but right now he was very kind enough uh, to let me requisition uh, one of his sheds here uh, to pull together a whole bunch of different machinery. Um, before I start, hopefully it'll be uh, clear to you. 
uh, throughout the field day that it, even for a virtual field day, it takes uh, a lot of planning and support to make something like this happen. And we couldn't do this without our sponsors, uh, most of which have been with us since the beginning, you know, four years ago. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge them. So uh, please uh, hang on with me. Uh, first of all, Sioux Growing Supply from the ginseng fields of northern Wisconsin. Um, they offer all manner of specialty crop supplies, such as soils, pots, and fertilizers. Uh, Cult Crest, uh, precision German-engineered weeding tools for all scales. Osborne Quality Seeds, independent family-owned seed dealer specializing in vegetable herb uh, seeds. Rodale Institute's Midwest Organic Center, providing research to support growers and expand organic acreage in the Midwest. Uh, small Farm Works, supplier of paper chain system for fast transplanting and precision Japanese weeding tools. Sutton Ag Enterprises, custom made and imported specialty crop equipment from seeders to harvesters, including precision weeding tools. Uh, Tillmore, American made precision weeding tools, as well as tractors and other machinery for small farms. Treffler, uh, Manit Machine, suppliers of innovative agricultural machines, including the unique Treffler Time Weeder. Uh, and then some media sponsors. Uh, growing for Market Magazine is for local food producers, keeps you informed about the business of growing, selling fruits, vegetables, flowers, and Vegetable Growers News and Organic Grower Magazine, the national magazine to keep you informed on all issues affecting vegetable and organic growers. Let me pause and Liz just ask you if you're still with us. I'm sorry, the, the signal here is uh, not very good. We are still seeing you. Um, and luckily we've That's taught some fantastic. of our viewers how to, how to unlock their camera screens. So not all is lost. Nice, <laughs> nice, okay. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, onward. Uh, the first thing where I wanted to start, and here I'll show you, uh, Liz, is it more helpful to be vertical or horizontal? If you can be horizontal, that's, that's the preferred. If you got that, there you go. Great. 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 Um, the first place I wanted to start, and you can see a, a, a veritable, boy, I don't know, den of cultivation tools that we have here. But the first place I wanted to start was here at the cedar. And hopefully that seems uh, appropriate to you. And the reason I wanted to start there is that um, oftentimes, you know, we show up at a farm and we start setting up a weeding tool and all of a sudden we realize, oh man, we, we, can't, we can't weed this, at least uh, not more than one row at a time. And the reason is that, um, the reason is that it hasn't been seeded accurately. And so I really suggest when people are getting into precision weeding tools, the first place they start um, is the transplanter or the cedar. Um, and what I would really do in the winter or the start of each season um, is I would lay out my rows. So Peter here has a few different row configurations. Um, this is for seven rows. He's on um, 72 inch uh, centers uh, for his tractor tires, so six foot bed. But what I would do is I would start out, um, I would measure exactly where uh, I want my units to be. And to be even more precise, you know, some of you may have the, the blessing of brand new uh, seeding tools, which is wonderful. Uh, but you can see here, Peter has uh, um, Planet Junior Seeders, which is very common. Um, but these tools, you know, can be 50, 70 years old. And so where the seed comes out, you know, down here at the bottom, uh, the shoe here, that might not actually line up with where it's clamped. You know, things can get out of square. Um, so what I would do is I would take a paint marker or so, and I would mark on the ground uh, concrete or, you know, if you're not so lucky, just put out a piece of plywood um, and mark exactly where your rows should be. And then make sure your cedars are right there. So when you mark where they should be in your toolbar, um, you can line them up exactly where the seed is falling. So you're not depending on everything being straight. You're double checking it. Um, then when you have uh, some knowledge of where the seed's coming out, um, what I would do, one of my, one of my uh, favorite things when I'm adjusting tools is two things. One is a Sharpie. Sharpie's not even a sponsor of this field day. We should get them in here. And the other is a paint marker. I just bought this one. We'll see uh, if it's ready to go. The paint markers are great because they're really bright um, and they're permanent. And so what I would do is um, once I have everything set and I know where on the toolbar I want my cedar to be, I would go ahead. Looks like this paint marker is... Uh, need a little more warming up. But I would go ahead and mark with a bright color paint marker on either side of the toolbar exactly where I want that tool to go. And for now, I'll use a Sharpie, um, but you'll see uh, it's not as easily visible, you know, say from the tractor seat. And so I would want a real bright mark there right on that line. And the reason is that, you know, nothing is perfect. We live in a physical world. And throughout the season, things can get loose and bounce around. And so if you have real bright marks there, you can start to tell uh, when, a, when a clamp is moving and kind of covering that up. 
And so before you get off by, you know, half an inch, an inch, and even every time you seed, you can just easily look. You don't even have to pull out a measuring tape, and you can make sure that your seeders are um, dead on every time. So those are some of the kind of winter, um, winter jobs that, that might be nice just to make sure that you're set up for, um, for, the, for seeding. And so you can match your tools up later on. Okay. I'm going to take us over somewhere else. Join me, won't you? Um, the tool that we're going to look at for a little bit here is um, a rear-mounted steerable toolbar, okay? And maybe this is uh, new to some of you, or maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, but this is what I was able to get my hands on. Um, the reason I chose this for our adjustment today is that, one, it's new, so it's easy for me to move things around. Um, and two, there's a lot of space on this tool. Now, some people are using these rear-mounted toolbars, and that's great. Um, but I'm big into principles. And so principles, you know, transfer between all sorts of things. And so the principles that we use for adjusting this machine, um, you could similarly use on a, a belly mounted tool, or you could similarly use even on a rear mounted tool. It's the same principle. So hopefully you don't get hung up, you know, that you don't have a, a rear mounted um, steerable toolbar. You know, what we're going to do is, is going to work for anything. Okay. Um, first thing I would do, uh, when I'm looking at adjusting a toolbar uh, is um, finding the center point, okay? And we can see here that I put a white piece of tape here, and that's just so we could see everything really easily. Um, and so put up a, measure, a uh, measuring tape here on the end. Oh. We should also get uh, Milwaukee brand tools to sponsor here because that's the measuring tape. And here we go right to the middle, and I go to the end of the uh, toolbar. Well, Let's hope it holds. And I measure the full length of my toolbar. And then I can go halfway to the middle, okay? And there's that 39 and a half. I'll put a mark there one second. Okay. So when I found the middle of my toolbar, uh, now that's where I can go off of things, okay? Um, usually people are going to have a plant row right in the middle and your spacing might dictate, dictate something differently. Um, but once we have our center point, then we can measure off that. And so the first thing I would do is I would measure and I would put uh, my plants. So I know just where my plants are. Um, so in this case, we had this set up for two or three rows. And so I know that I'm going to have one plant in the middle. I know that approximately, here we go, uh, 18 inches apart. I'm going to have another plant. I put a P there, and I'm going to put a little arrow. I'm sorry that my writing isn't so good. And I'd measure off of that center point, and right here would be another plant row. Okay. Now I have my three plant rows marked. And once I have that, uh, that's sort of my Bible. You know, I can go off of that. Okay. Um, now, depending on the type of tools you're using, some of them run right over the row. And some of them run in between, uh, sorry, in between, in between the rows. Usually you'll have a wheel like this running in between the rows, okay? Um, so now I have my center point marked. I have my plant row marked. Now I can split that in half. So let's say that I am uh, 18 inches from center point. That's pretty common, three 18 inch rows. Um, now I can mark where my parallel unit's gonna go. And for me, I'll put an arrow and then I put a T for tool. And you can see each, each letter, the P or the T, I have an arrow on. And again, you know, call me anal, but I'm just trying to get things as precise as I can. And then same here, I have my center point and I have my plant row here. And I'm gonna mark right in between and I'm gonna put a T. And I know that's where my tools are now. Okay, now we can walk along to the back. And Liz, you feel free to interrupt me at any time, okay? I sure will. Great. Your audio is coming through really good. I'll the video is a bit there. jumpy, but I think we're getting, getting everything we need. Okay, we'll do what we can. Um, so the first thing I wanted to point out um, is setting the depth. I think adjusting a tool like this in the workshop is something a lot of people don't do. And it's easy not to do. You know, you think, oh, I'll just go to the field and I can match it to conditions at the field. And that can make a certain amount of sense, um, especially if you don't have the type of precision that you might want in your seeding or your transplanting. But I've also had the experience where I get to the field and kind of everything seems off. No matter what I adjust, it never matches up. Um, so I think it's good to get to the point, if you can, where the seeder or the transplanter is a known quantity, it's set up, and your seeder is kind of a known uh, quantity, it's set up. And so 
um, it's helpful to me to do these things in the shop so I know that everything's uh, even. And then if I need to make small adjustments in the field, I can do that. Okay. So first thing I would do, um, I'll take this out of uh, transport mode one moment. Okay. And now I've got the unit here on the ground. The first thing I want to do um, is set the depth of my tools. Okay. Um, one of the big things that people think about now with cultivating is more shallow cultivation. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one, uh, the more shallow you run, you're not bringing up more weed seeds from below that, you know, magic three quarter inch depth from which they wouldn't otherwise germinate. Um, the other thing is you can uh, work the soil when it's wetter. You know, you might imagine uh, soon after a rain, the first inch or two has dried out, drawn, uh, dried out but a few inches deeper, it's too wet. And so if you're able to run your tools very shallow, sometimes you can get into the field between rains uh, when otherwise you wouldn't. Okay, so how do you get that precision? Um, this is a piece of three quarter inch plywood. Uh, I had to have this specially imported from Italy for the field day, but you guys are worth it. Thanks a lot of sponsors. Um, so three quarter inch plywood. And you can get, you know, any thickness plywood you want, whatever you want your depth set at. Um, three quarter inches, three eighths, half inch, you know, whatever you want to run things. But that's what I'm going to, I'm going to put my wheel on uh, to know exactly what my depth is at. So here I'm going to lower this wheel down. This happens to have a nice screw jack. Um, a lot of other wheels are adjusted in different ways and that's just fine. Hey Sam, why are you so doing that adjustment? I've adjusted my... Sam, what, what, sorry, brand of, what brand of cultivator is this and, and is it similar models in other brands? Yes. Um, here's the sticker. So this is a Cult Crest brand. Uh, the name of the machine is an Argus. Um, but this can be uh, had also from the Steckity company through Sutton Ag. Um, a lot of people will make these on their own, the steerable frame, and then they'll buy tooling from another company. Um, and we'll look at some other um, examples of uh, different manufacturers. So this particular one is Cult Crest. Uh, it's available uh, also from Steckity and, and other places as well. Any other questions at the moment? Nope, go on. Okay. Um, so here we put our gauge wheel our depth control here on this piece of plywood, okay? And now we know that our whole unit is raised three quarter inches above the ground. And this is where it's really nice to have a concrete floor. Or if you don't have it, you know, a flat area or gravel, or you could always just put down a few sheets of plywood. Um, and we know that when we get to the field, the conditions will be different. And though, of course, we always strive for uniformity in our beds, it's not gonna be there. But if we can set this up in the shop, we know at least uh, the machine is even, okay. So we are at a depth of um, three quarter inches. And now my tools, I've got them loose here, uh, and they can rise up and down. But if they're on the concrete floor and my wheel's three quarter inches above, I know that their depth is three quarter inches deep. Hopefully that makes sense. You know, the wheel would be running uh, on top of the soil surface right here. And so if I do this with, um, with each unit, now I know that the depth is gonna be uh, is gonna be uniform on each of my tools. And of course, when I get to the field, I can change that. Um, but for right now, I'm, I'm running a uniform depth. Peter, give us a, give us a quick hello. Hello, everybody. Peter, Peter's uh, nice enough to have us and, and he'll be uh, joining us next week too. All right, great. Um, okay, Peter has impeccable time as you can see. So, uh, so we've set the depth, and now we want to set our tools um, in and out. And here uh, we see I should drop that knife down. Let me grab a wrench. <laughs> okay. So um, here's the, the look from the back, okay? And you can see that the crop is running right down the middle, okay? Um, when it comes to tools, you really got to think about your crop. And of course, the more that people use, um, their cultivation equipment, the more they're gonna get a feel for this. There's a few rules of thumb um, that Hans and I, sorry, Hans Bishop and I um, like to work from. We came up with a sort of weeding uh, uh, resource uh, a year or so ago. Um, the first thing is for tender direct seeded crops, you wanna get as close as you can um, because they're, they're less competitive, but it also, uh, they're less competitive. And so you, it's hard to get very close. Um, rule of thumb, something like on either side of that row of carrots or so, uh, one and a quarter inches. And what that means is that the distance between the tools is gonna be between two and three inches. So you've got a two or three inch strip of uncultivated soil where your direct seeded 
uh, tender crop is, and you've got tools running on either side of that. Um, and of course, as they get bigger, you can move out more and more. Um, transplanted crops, you can be more aggressive with, especially with finger weeders, and so you don't have to get as close. Also, they usually have foliage that would get in the way from getting too close. Um, these particular knives right here have what we call cranked shafts. Um, and so they're a little weaker, so some of our you know, larger row crop growers that are going over a lot of acreage might not like them, but you can see they leave a real nice area for crop foliage. So for something like you know, kale, uh, we wouldn't be breaking off leaves with a crankshaft like this. Okay, and we'll talk about knife shape and stuff later. Um, one thing to think about is the distance between your sweeps. Um, if they get too close, you're gonna start catching residue. Okay, um, so you want to have from front to back a fair amount of distance between the tools. Um, if you have, you know, perfect soil, you can sneak them closer together, but with any amount of a residue, you want to have your tools separated. Um, the other thing to think about is uh, overlap. So you can see here that these two tools overlap. And in fact, this knife is sitting right over the center point of this sweep, which is exa about exactly what we want to see. Um, so that somewhat of half the tool is, is getting covered. And that means that um, there's no weed that's going to sneak around here, especially something thicker like, say, a thistle root or something that can kind of walk along the edge. Um, even if it does that, you know, the next tool is going to get it. Okay. Uh, let me look at my notes here. I'd hate to forget something. Um, ah, okay. Then we start thinking about in-row tools one step back. Um, there's a few different in-row tools that are available, and we'll look at some over there. Um, but a really popular one is finger weeders, and that's for good reason. Um, they do a great job at reaching near the row or into the row. Um, here in particular, um, there's two different sizes that are on this machine, um, but they're available uh, from most companies in say three different sizes. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of the finger weeders, but right here we have, um, we have a size that we might commonly use for um, corn or beans, or maybe uh, bigger transplants. Uh, the larger the finger weeder, the more uh, aggressive it's gonna be. Um, also, a lot of people need a smaller size finger weeder just to fit their rows. So, for example, for 15-inch rows, um, we would need a smaller size, you know, than these um, more kind of row crop finger weeders. I'll give you a tip while we're talking on finger weeders, just so I don't forget. Um, a lot of times, you know, the fingers will get bent up um, from a lot of use. You know, these are pretty new, but from a lot of use, they'll start getting bent up. Um, one sort of maintenance piece you can do in the winter is um, take this bottom plate off here, you can see the nuts, uh, and take your finger weeder and just flip it over. And now instead of being kind of curled up, they're curled down into the ground and they'll slowly flex back out. So you can kind of keep using those and keep them aggressive. Um, okay, the finger weeders are mounted uh, on this particular machine on a spring-loaded arm. Um, in general, finger weeders work best when they have some amount of flexibility. So whatever that is, if that's on a uh, S-tine, if that's on a spring-loaded arm, um, there's a lot of possibilities. And they still work okay when they're mounted or welded straight to the, um, to the parallel linkage. But this particular toolbar, you can see that um, it can flex up and down with the spring right here. Uh, right now, it's resting back on these fingers, so I, I can't really lift this up. Um, what I would do when I had this machine set, I would uh, lift the spring-loaded arm, and I would just rest something in there, say my wrench, and then I would set it back down. And so the spring-loaded arm is set up just a little bit, you know, I don't know, a half inch or something. Um, and then I would drop my fingers down into the soil. And you can imagine then when I pull my wrench away, uh, there's down pressure pushing into the soil because I've set them, you know, just a little bit deeper than the arm is. Um, and so that's going to that's gonna have them reaching down into the ground. And so even as the ground um, level changes, you know, because of course none of us have perfect fields, um, the fingers will still be in contact with the soil. Okay. I'll pause there for a second, Liz. Well, Sam, okay. I, yeah, I just keep going. I think people are, are listening engagedly, which is not a word. Well, or, or at least we'll assume so. Okay. Um, so those are some of the basics of setting up a machine that I would think about, um, especially if I had the time in the winter, or early spring to match it up to, um, to my planting scheme, um, or if I was switching planting schemes, you know, row spacings. Now I wanted to go on just a little bit of a tour. Um, not since I was in Switzerland have I seen so many wonderful weeding tools all in one place. So I'll have to send this. Um, I wanted to look at a few.
Sam, I think we got a little pause in your video, so we'll just wait and see if we catch up with you again here. This, I don't know oh. if it looks familiar to anyone, hold but up. Um, hold, this is a up. Planet Junior Weeding Unit that was toolbar. You can see that the parallel units clamp on at the head Sam. right there. Sam? You can see the parallel with the tool to flex up. And hey, Sam, we're, our video seems to be missing from you at the moment. Um, so uh, you might need to, to exit and come back real quick just to make sure that, that, that the Zoom link maybe needs to refresh. All right, looks like, oh, maybe we got him back. Phoebe, can you give him another spotlight? All right, Sam, you're muted now. There you go. Go ahead and try your audio. Okay, but now I know what to do this time. All right, here we are. Uh, are you there? We're here, you're set to go. Okay, okay, sorry that I, I wandered too far away, so I'll have to stay here. So anyway, just to say that older tools can work just fine. Um, the big thing I would recommend is replacing nuts and bolts. Um, even on this brand new machine that we were just uh, testing in the field a little bit this summer, I, sh I started to strip a lot of the heads on the bolts. Um, and so they might last a season, but I think it's really worth your money, you know, I don't know, 10 cents a bolt or whatever it is, um, to get um, a hardened bolts. And if they're starting to get worn, you know, replace them in the winter because it's a big pain when they start to get stripped. Okay, so there we have an older Planet Junior tool. Um, then there's a lot of other options. Uh, another in-row tool that we have, this particular one's from the Tillmore Company. Um, this is a torsion weeder. I used to work a lot with this tool at uh, Michigan State. And here this would mount to a toolbar. Um, it can be adjusted both up and down and in and out of the row. And then the tool contacts the row here. And because it's spring steel, it will bounce just outside of the row um, when the tension is just right. This tool can do amazing work, um, but uh, it's just harder to have it hold an adjustment than the finger weeders, I find. Uh, so other people might have a, a great um, time with that. Uh, there's all sorts of options with tools, you know, so here's another torsion weeder that's just a little thicker than that one. Um, here's something new that the Tumor Company's coming out with, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell you, it's called a carrot tip. Uh, so you can see how it, it's just a little more blunt of a tip for better roll contact uh, for those tender crops. So I don't know if I was supposed to show you that, but uh, hopefully I don't get in trouble with Liddell. Um, okay, so in-row tools. Other tools that can do a great job later on are uh, spider weeders. And they're commonly set to um, throw soil into the row for hilling. Um, you know, common crops, we might think of that with, say, potatoes or leeks. Um, but other crops can also benefit from a little bit of hilling for in-row weed control, like uh, even carrots, we found. Um, and there's different sizes, you know, a larger, more aggressive spider weeder, um, and then smaller ones as well. The other thing you can do um, that we can talk about with uh, cutaway discs is you can set them like this to throw soil into the row, if I was moving that way. Um, but you can also set them like this to pull soil away. So if I had um, a more established crop and say my soil was uh, very crusted or a heavier soil, I could use these spiders to pull soil away from the row. And I think the Tillmore Company now with their basket weeders, it's available to get spider weeders that run um, right ahead of the baskets to, to really break any crust. Okay, um, other options. Um, would be something like this uh, cutaway disc. And this is offered from a few different companies. I think uh, uh, Steckity, Colt Crest, other, other people, and you can also kind of make your own. The magic that happens here are these cutaway discs. And let me try and show it from the front. Uh, sorry for switching my phone there. So these cutaway discs, and you can set them very narrowly. You know, these are about uh, two and a half inches maybe. And you see how they're pointing away from the row. And what that means is that they pull soil away from the row. And because they, they cut the soil, they can deal with a crust very well. Again, sorry about my shoddy camera work. Um, so for people, you know, with sandy soils, they might never have a problem. But for people with heavier clay soils, you know that when you pull a chunk uh, of soil out of the ground, it can pull your crop with it. And so these cutaway discs do a great job of that. And the way that this is set is so that these knives right here are just in between the front edge of the disc and the back edge of the disc. So we still have that overlap. The front end of the uh, disc is getting very close to the crop. And these down cut knives right here are still cutting the soil uh, and then uh, working the soil further away until you know we might have a sweep uh, out here or something. Again, with proper overlap. So you know I wouldn't want it to be right here. I'm gonna catch a lot of residue. 
I want to give it good front to back spacing, and I also want to give it good overlapping speed worst. Okay. Um, then I wanted to talk about, hey guys, I want to talk about a few mounting options. Um, so that um, cold crest tool, toolbar we looked at um, had what we might call vibro shanks or E-springs. And here's another option. Um, this is a, uh, a Tillmore sweep. You can see that it's got a welded stub and then you can put your shank on. Um, and the thing with vibro springs that's just wonderful is it's a really good uh, mix between the seat tine and between something being rigidly mounted. And what I mean is if, so, if something's bolted on your toolbar and you hit a rock, you might just break whatever's on your toolbar. Um, and you know, people have known about that for years. So for example, here is a old um, sweep from International, you know, and this would be say in the 50s or something. Um, and you can see that they have this spring here it's called the trip shank. And that, so it was rigidly mounted. So if they didn't have uh, uh, any flexibility there, when you hit a stone, the whole thing would break. But because there's a trip shank on it, when this hits a stone or something, it can trip back. So they even knew that some flexibility was necessary. Um, and the way that, that people are uh, addressing that now is with these E-springs. So here's another example of what we'd call like an E-spring or a vibro shank. And so it gives your tool just enough flexibility to not break when it hits a rock, but also to keep it pretty generally on the roll. Okay. Hey, Sam. Yeah. One clarifying uh, question. You, you were talking about the, the fore aft uh, distance between your tools and that there's some difference yeah. in how much residue you have. Are there sort of uh, benchmarks that people should follow for that distance based on their soil conditions? Yeah, I would say a good uh, benchmark. So here, let me grab a measuring tape just so we can uh, see pretty easily. Yep. You never want, yep. we need Milwaukee Tool Company to uh, sponsor us so we'll have more of their nice tapes. You never want to be touching um, in terms of right here, that front to back space. No, you know, even if you have perfect sand, um, you never want to be touching. So here, let me put my tape there. Good rule of thumb, if you can do it, is six inches. Okay, uh, for some uh, tools that's hard to swing, especially say if we get underneath the belly of a G. Um, so six inches, I would say would be my rule of thumb. Um, but but uh, once you get under four inches, I really start to worry about residue. And again, if you've got perfect sand, you can really push those rules of thumb I've given you. Um, but the more residue you have, the more likely you're get, you are to get caught up. Um, another thing I'll mention about residue, and you know maybe this is kind of getting into the weeds too much with this, pun intended. Um, is the type of shanks. So for example, um, here's two shanks and you'll notice that they're swept back. You see how they're bent right there? Um, and the reason they do that, you know, as opposed to like this shank, you know, it's not swept back, it's right there. The reason they do that is the further back the shank is from the cutting edge, the more chance residue has to kind of move around and flow. Um, and so that's why they bend it back because if the shank's right up at the front, it's a lot easier for stuff to tangle around there. Anyway, just something to look for. Um, I also wanted to point out just all the different options and sweeps. Um, this would be what we call a, a beat knife or a side knife. You know, it can get real close to the row. You can also switch sides so that say when your kale canopy's out, you're now reaching under the row. Um, this would be another uh, possibility for knives. This is called a down cut. So it's cutting the soil as it goes and hopefully cutting a crust. Um, uh, here on the cutaway disc is another example of a down cut knife. So again, as it moves through the soil, it's cutting downward like a knife cutting cake. You know? So for people with heavier soils um, that crust, these down cut knives can be really nice. Another thing to point out, just for fun, uh, on some knives, there'll be um, holes in the back. And these are so you can bolt crop shields. So you can really kind of dial in how much soil is flowing um, down into the crop row. Again, maybe too much detail for some people, um, but for those growing really tender crops, it can be worthwhile um, for crop shields to get exactly the right amount of soil flow in there. Um, different types of uh, sweeps. These are A-blades from Tillmore. Uh, again, this is a new prototype from them. These are called uh, cube tips. Uh, they're supposed to really moderate the flow of soil moving through the crops. I haven't tried these cube, uh, cube tips uh, yet, but uh, we'll see. Uh, this is a like new you... knife. Uh... Yeah, sorry, yeah. Liz. No, I was just going to ask about that J shank. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, you, you've heard of uh, banana knives. This is an eggplant knife. Uh, and again, it's really good at just reaching underneath the crop. 
Um, and I forget the manufacturer on that tool. I hear that they don't hold up very well uh, in soils though. Okay, um, all different types of knives uh, and different quality that you can pay for, you know? Um, so uh, for example, these knives are goldenized steel, so it's just harder steel. Uh, and same thing, these sweeps here are goldenized, so it's just a harder steel. Now, of course, they're more expensive. Um, so for people that are running a lot of acreage, like we talked to um, Jared Oman last week, he said that um, he started with um, a certain type of metal sweep, but at the end realized that he needed a harder sweep um, for his soil to stand up. Uh, sorry, for his tool to stand up to his soils. So there's all different options here. Um, you can see that these um, shanks are cranked, just like the other ones we looked at, um, so that there's room for a canoping plant. Uh, this might be for, say, soybeans, so that there's room for the soybeans to run through without starting to knock off leaves. Um, this is a new tool, uh, leak shank. Uh, haven't tried it out yet. I think they just sent this to me from uh, the Netherlands. So I'll be interested to let you know how it goes. Nice blanching um, on that one. Then finger weeders. Say that again, Liz. Oh, I was just going to comment. Your your new leak shank has a nice nice blanching on it. Oh yeah, yeah. They 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 really are good with their um their leak metallurgy. I find in the Netherlands, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, enough with that, Liz. We got to move on. Um, I think as people know, as people know, there's a lot of different varieties of finger weeders. They're available from all sorts of companies. Um, I think the big thing to know is one, the size. So the bigger the finger weeder, the more aggressive it'll be. Um, generally, you want the ability to be more aggressive. Um, the reason that people t go for smaller sizes is usually because of row space. And so if people have uh, more narrow rows, you know, 12 inch rows, 15 inch rows, you have to shrink down the size of the fingers so that they're not um, hitting the next tool, you know. Um, the other thing to point out is there's different hardnesses. Um, so here's an orange finger. Um, and I believe there's also a red color. Each company have, has different sizes, but generally there'll be three colors and one will be very soft. So say if someone's in beach sand, you know, you don't want to be moving a lot of soil. Um, or on the other hand, you might want like a red finger. If someone's in very hard clay, you want a very stiff um, finger weeder to move soil. Um, the other thing I wanted to say just a word about is crop shields. Um, here's one style of crop shield that could run, you know, near the crop row. Um, you could set it to fill a little bit of soil. You could set it to cut away. Um, I had a sort of revelation about crop shields when I realized they're not really to shield the crop, or I guess it's just how you think about it. It's really to um, tune in the amount of soil you're throwing towards the crop. So these are, are disc crop shields, but you can also have, um, you know, the flat pieces of metal that lay right near the row. And what you want is you want to set them so that you're tucking just the right amount of soil in to bury in row weeds. Um, but to leave your crop unharmed. Sam, okay. I got a couple couple questions for you here. So, yeah. so the first one, while you're standing by the finger weeders there, can the finger weeders yeah. be staggered to allow for narrower rows while keeping a larger diameter? Yeah, they can, you, you can do that. Here's the thing. Um, first of all, for certain rows, even if you stagger them, the backside of the finger weeder, you know, when it's in the ground like this, um, the backside here, you might even start hitting your crop on the other row. But sure, if you can fit them in there, stagger them, the thing to realize is when they're staggered, they're less aggressive because they're not right opposite each other pulling at weeds. So that's a great option to try. Um, but just remember, of course, closer to the row, more aggressive. And also when they're directly opposite each other, they're more aggressive. Great. And one other question right now. What's the smallest horsepower tractor that could, um, that, that could use some of these implements? Great, uh, let's switch over. Uh, it's almost like I planned it. Here's a G, uh, Alice Chalmers G, which most people may be familiar with. Um, this is the last you know, large scale production, uh, well, belly mounted tractor in the US. And it has a four cylinder yeah. continental engine. Sam, I think we, we're, we're still, oh, there we go, we caught up with you. <laughs> Carry yeah. on, Okay. we're with you. Okay. So these G's are pretty old. They have a four cylinder engine. Someone might want to correct me, but I, I would say they don't mu have much over say 15, 20 horsepower. Um, but they can do a great job pulling weeding tools. Um, so for example, right here, we've got a basket weeder set up in there. Um, this would be for Peter's carrots. Um, this is a four roll uh, basket weeding machine. Um, and uh, you can see here in the front, uh, that he's got sweeps set up to break the crust. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, basket, well, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting off track, Liz. Uh, the answer is very low horsepower will pull weeding tools. 
um, as long as your soil has been properly prepared. So if there's like a bunch of clods or grass, et cetera, you're going to have a lot more trouble pulling tools. The draft of the tools themselves usually isn't the issue if you have def decent soil prep. What, what's usually the issue is finding a machine with the right clearance to fit the tools in. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so just to point out the basket weeder here, uh, a lot of times the baskets will just kind of scuff the surface of the soil and not bite in. Uh, again, if you have a heavier soil. And one thing that can be nice um, is to run sweeps up ahead of the baskets like we have here. Um, or like we mentioned, you can put spiders to run up in front of the uh, baskets and kind of crumble the soil. Um, there's a few different options for um, parallel units or things that work um, with, uh, yeah, with belly mounting. Yeah. Sam, I hate to interrupt you again, but our video is frozen on you. There, okay, we caught, we caught up with you again, so maybe just... Uh... Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop moving, okay? Okay, here, all right. Here, here we have the, the limitations of, uh, well, I, I hate to say it, but a federal government that doesn't support uh, rural broadband. But anyway, okay. Uh, so here's a parallel unit. This one, I think, is from the Tillmore Company. And you can see that sweep running right down the middle that's going to erase your tire track. And then you can see this particular one has a, a side knife, a beat knife, um, right beside it. And it's really nice when you have flexibility in your tools. So, for example, this one has one, two, three different toolbars. Um, the other thing you can uh, reverse, right? So we were saying, for example, that we want enough separation between our tools. So I might put a clamp right here and put my tool shank uh, uh, through here, and it might be too close to the next tool, you know? Well, if you have an assortment of clamps, uh, especially ones different sizes, you know, this one I could turn around. And now all of a sudden I've got more space between the two tools front to back. And you can see that's what I did here. I put that clamp as on the furthest back um, toolbar, and I had the clamp facing backwards so that there'd be the maximum amount of front to back distance between those two tools. Um, and uh, another nice thing for, for modern tools is being able to adjust down pressure. So this particular tool, there's a spring right here, and I can, uh, I can move it up and down off of these notches, okay? And uh, what that allows me to do is put a tool with more or less force into the soil. So let's say um, it just rained or I'm cultivating a tire track or I'm at another field and it's heavy clay and the tools just aren't biting. It's nice to be able to adjust uh, the amount of pressure down into the soil. Okay. Um, this is another option of a tool that works well in belly mounted uh, conditions because it's so short front to back. You know, there's very little space here front to back. Um, this one's from Cult Crest, but Steckity makes a similar model. You just saw Tillmore there. Um, and this one's set up with all the things you need for precision cultivation. So it's got gauge wheels here. It's got cutaway discs right here that are set to pull soil away from the row. It's got side knives here to cultivate further away until you could set a sweep, you know, back here or something. And then it's got finger weeders as well. Um, the other thing that this tool has, uh, again, would be um, a spring to change the amount of down pressure. So depending on where you mount that spring, you have a different amount of down pressure. Um, Hopefully that's a decent run through of our type of row tools that deal on a row system. I did want to take just a minute or two to talk about tine weeders too. Liz, do, are we doing okay on time? Well, we're, we have run short on time, but I think that people will like to stay and hear you talk about the tine weeders. So I will allow you to carry on, Sam. Oh man, I love this lady. She's so gracious. Okay, so um, this is what people are probably familiar with. This is what we call uh, a Laley tine weeder. You know, you can see from the label, the Jacobs company in the Netherlands makes it, but whatever. They use these Laley tines that you see on all sorts of um, tools. And you guys know maybe how you switch them, which is you lift up here and you change the notch that that spring is on. And you can see as I did that, the spring pulls up and down out of the soil. So I'm changing the aggressiveness to that tool. Um, this can be a fantastic tool uh, for a lot of crops. Imagine potatoes, you know, you just plant them and maybe a week later, right before emergence, you go through and kind of pull down those hills before you reform them. Um, the only uh, drawback for this tool, well, not the only one, but um, one, when you want to make an adjustment in the field, you've got, I don't know, 30 different times to adjust. So that can be a pain. Um, the other thing is it doesn't follow the contour of the ground. And what I 
mean is if you have a raised potato hill, you know, say the ground's higher here, really level things out um, and not follow, follow any ground contours. And so it's not capable of super precise work, but again, often it's, it's uh, just a ticket. The other thing that I wanted to compare it with is uh, a newer tool that's available. This is the Treffler uh, Tine Weeder. And you'll notice a big difference here is that each tine has an individual spring, okay? These particular um, tines also have a form of cuke tips on them. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, they're copying Tillmore or vice versa, but uh, you can see a lot of people are racing for this new cuke tip technology, but I don't want to get sidetracked. Um, each tine has an individual spring and these cables run back to a single axle here. And what you can do is, you'll see the numbers stamped in the steel, you can turn this wheel, you know, on larger, say, uh, you know, 30 foot models, it's just hydraulic with a switch from the tractor, but you can turn this wheel and now every tine all at the same time has been adjusted with equal tension. So one, it's very easy to adjust all the tines, but the other thing is because each of them have um, the spring mechanism, and I won't get into it, but because each of them have the spring mechanism, they maintain a constant down pressure. And what that means is it's pretty incredible. If you were to say run over a hill of potatoes, every part of that ground would receive equal pressure to be worked. So those hills would actually remain. The top would not get pulled down any more than the bottom. Um, so this is kind of like, you know, um, Tine Weeder 2.0. Uh, so if that's a, a tool that you think would be helpful in your toolbox, uh, that would be something to consider. I suppose I'll put this back on what I hope is my beautiful face. Um, Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you so much for the sponsors for making this possible. Um, thanks for Peter for hosting. You might imagine uh, when your friend comes and says, hey, let me uh, use a bunch of your machinery and half your shed for the day. You might not be excited, but he was excited. Um, and I hope to see a lot of you guys next week when uh, weather permitting, Peter and I will have a lot of these tools out into the field. Um, so again, thank you very much. And uh, I'll hand it back to Liz. All right. Thank you, Sam. And hopefully next week, so we, Sam and I have practiced this and know that the Wi-Fi can be better out here. So hopefully next week we'll have a little bit of a smoother ride through the video there. And uh, we'll, we'll make sure and try to get that set up for you all next week. But thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we have reached the end of our time, surpassed it. Um, and to all of you on Facebook, thank you so much for attending this live event today. If you want to rewatch or share with your friends, you can find the video of this event and many others on PFI's Facebook page, the Land Connections Facebook page, or either of our YouTube channels and websites. We at PFI would also like to thank our major sponsors for their support of our virtual field day season, which features over 60 field days and of which this field day is a part. So their, their support makes, helps make uh, all of these field days free and open to everyone. And you can attend all of them free of charge and find them on our website, practicalfarmers.org. Thank you sponsors. And we have conquered the, the, uh, the, the, the implements today, but next week we'll be back with episode three, First Encounters, and steel shall meet the soil. That is, we'll be looking at precision cultivation for direct seeded crops with Sam and Peter at Springdale Farm. For those of you that are certified crop advisors in the audience, snap this QR code or email Cassidy at the Land Connection. She'll put her email uh, in the chat box, and it's also up there on the slide to receive your CEU credits. And um, please take a few minutes to complete the evaluation that Cassidy has posted in the comment box on Facebook. For participating, you'll be entered to win uh, some field day swag, like the hat Sam was sporting in the video there. He's still supposed to send me one. And more importantly, we will receive your feedback. And until next time, stay healthy, help your neighbors, and may the force be with you. <laughs>